Well, good morning. Good to see you today. Glad that you're here. If you're joining us online, we are glad that you're part of our service today. Uh, in, in Christ, you know, we can join in and all over the world and still be connected by the Spirit of God, which I love that so much. And you are certainly welcome. We are in a series that we started a few weeks ago. Uh, we start, it's a series about relationships. We like to do that every once in a while because we all have relationships that could improve. We need to get a little better at it. And so we're in this achieving uh, sanity when it comes to uh, our relationships, achieving relational sanity and, and, and trying to avoid some mistakes. I think all of us sometimes do things that we're kind of, we regret, they're foolish. A number of years ago, uh, my family, my kids were younger at the time, and we decided to take a cruise. It, it actually left one of the ones that left out of Norfolk here, a uh, carnival cruise down to, you know, I guess Bahamas or something. So when my kids were young, they used to love to go swimming. So they loved, you know, they really wanted to go swimming on the, the, the pool on the boat. And one of the things we would do when we'd go swim into a public pool is I used to like to launch them out of the air. I had three boys. They loved it. Uh, the lifeguard, not so much. Uh, and sometimes other people in the pool, not so much. But so what I would do is, is I'd get, I'd, I'd get them on my kind of like you'd play chicken or something, you know, you'd get a leg on each side and I'd, I'd, I'd get down as low as I could under the water. And then I would just launch as hard as I could. And they would just like an ICBM missile launched from a sub, you know, they just like go flying and flailing and screaming. And it was our way of having fun. So we were on the cruise ship and I, they said, let's play that game launch. I thought, that's great. But there was a couple variables I wasn't, I wasn't counting on. One of the variables is all of the pools I had played that game with my kids. It was fresh. It was like chlorinated water, fresh water. This on the cruise ship, it was salt water. I guess they pump it in from the ocean or something. So just really salty water stinging your eyes. You can't see. So I had to go underwater and couldn't see. Second thing is it was, there's was a lot of waves when we were swimming. This is day one. So the boat was kind of going like this, and the water was sloshing back and forth. So this is a story about being foolish, in case you're not following. <laughs> so, so, my, so anyway, so I start launching my kids, and I'm launching them out. They're flailing around. People are, like, looking like this guy's, you know, like, does he not realize this is a public pool? What's going on, you know? And Which I didn't. You know, I'm just like, it's just me, you know? So I'm launching my kids. Well, anyways, I go under the water to launch one of my kids, and, um, and I accidentally grabbed two kids. I thought, dang, this is like, I got a kid under each arm. So, and I'm, I'm but I can't see, so I'm, I'm, I'm pushing as hard as I can, and my, I'm underwater, so I don't hear anything. But once my ears break the water line, I hear a lady going, oh my God. Oh. Somehow, somehow when I was trying to get one of my kids, I, the water slush, and I drifted underneath some lady's legs grabbed her legs around my, my shoulder. <laughs> An older lady, if that, I don't know if that matters, you know. And, she, well, you know, uh, it's only downhill from there. There's no recovery, you know. This is like a real sad deal. I look over to Sharon, she's like, she can't believe she wants to distance herself from me. So that's, I tell you that story because, you know, sometimes we do things that are unintentional that, we, you know, but it's still a huge mess up and we do that in our relationships and then we're trying to backpedal and figure out how can I get out of this and the Bible talks, I'm glad you're enjoying my pain. <laughs> so, and the Bible talks a lot about having wisdom in relationships. Now, when we add wisdom, it does not eliminate problems in our relationships, but it can reduce it. It can make relationships go quite a bit better. And so today we want to talk about, you know, especially if you have somebody you're not getting along well with, you have a crazy maker in your life, you have somebody who's causing a lot of challenges in your life. Well, there's ways you and I can be less foolish and more wise. So let's look at, we're going to, now you can look at Proverbs for Wisdom, great book there. We're going to be looking at James, the, almost the entire book is about wisdom. So if you need wisdom in your life, the book of James, great, 
it's actually, I mean, they call them books, but it's, it's like, it's a letter. It's something you could read in, 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 you know, I don't know, half an hour or something. But here's a portion we're going to look at. If you are wise and understand God's ways, you'll, lead, you'll live a life of steady goodness so that only good, lead, good deeds will pour forth. And if you don't brag about the good you do, then you will be truly wise. So he's talking about wisdom there. He says, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your hearts, he goes, that's not, that's not wisdom. So let's pause for a second. If you have those kinds of things going on in your life where there's, there's, there's anxiety, there's, there's tension, there's um, confusion, there's disharmony, you need wisdom in that. That's what makes the difference. And so he goes on, he says, that is the worst kind of lie to live in for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly and spiritual and motivated by the devil. So there's a spiritual element. Satan wants to cause problems in your relationships. Many of you already know that. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil. So there he's saying disorder, disunity, confusion, all those kinds of things. He says, that's just, you need wisdom in that situation. That's what, what it's called for. And so that's what he directs us to. He says, there's a heavenly wisdom. He says, but the wisdom from above is first of all, pure. So we're going to look at these six things today. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. So wisdom, is a, what we see here is, is a way of relating to people. It's not something you, 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 you learn at school. It's not, you don't get degrees in wisdom. There's people that have so many degrees, they could be called Dr. Fahrenheit doesn't mean they're wise. There's plenty of educated fools. They have no idea how to relate well to people, but they're, they might be brilliant. You can be super smart in technical things and in certain facts and in knowledge, but not be wise in relationships. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, hey, this is not about intelligence. This is asking for God's wisdom, wisdom that's from above. He goes on, he says, those who are peacemakers plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. That's my prayer, my hope for you and me, is that when we start to apply God's wisdom practices in our lives, we will reap a harvest, a harvest that's good, a harvest where you have less hostility, more harmony, where you sow seeds of trust. And those you and not distrust, and so you reap a good harvest from that. And really, this is like almost like a checklist. How are you doing? So, what I want you to do as we go through these six things, ask yourself, how am I doing in that area? Is that an area I could get better at? Foundations of a healthy relationship. First of all, he talks about it being pure. Wisdom is pure. He says the wisdom that comes from above, uh, from heaven, is first of all pure. In other words, it's uncorrupted. It's clean, it's unpolluted, it's untainted. The word, when you use this word in relationships, the word we use is integrity. Having integrity in your relationship. There's honesty. Your relationship is only as strong as you have integrity. It's, it's, if, if you're dishonest in your relationship, that's, there's, that relationship is, is, is a pseudo relationship. It's not very strong or it's not a relationship at all. It's, it's just all words because it's wisdom is not about the head. It's about the heart and where your heart is. And you build that it, it, through honesty. Leonard Keeler, he developed the lie detector test and he surveyed 25,000 people on his, on his lie detector test when he first started. And he came to the conclusion that most people lie. <laughs> like, okay, tell me something I didn't know. I mean, he said most people, that's their default, is they go, they, they lie. And, and, and it comes naturally to us. It's actually hard work to be honest and tell the truth. And that's not just lying to others. We lie to ourselves all the time. And we lie to God. Being honest to God, being honest to ourselves, being honest to others is not easy. That's why integrity is so rare. 
Living with integrity, letting that permeate your relationships is a mark of wisdom. Discard every form of dishonesty and lying so that you will be known as one who is always speaks the truth. So it's a mark of wisdom in your relationships. When you have integrity, when you speak the truth, when you're open about it. If I want to be wise, I won't compromise my integrity. It's not for sale. And so no matter, no matter what happens, no matter how difficult it gets, no matter what kind of blowback I have to suffer, we, we, honesty and, and integrity is absolutely vital. So you don't lead a double life. You're, 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 you're uh, up front and you have, God gives you a conscience. We're born with a conscience. We can actually, the Bible says you can actually sear that shut so that you, you do miss. There's people in the, the, in the world that are doing bad, bad stuff that they don't even know because they've, 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 the Bible talks about searing your conscience with a hot iron. And so you can actually deaden that part. But when you invite Christ into your life, God makes that conscience part of you more alive. You're more aware of how important integrity is. That's a mark of wisdom. God grants a treasure of good sense to the godly. He is their shield, protecting those who walk with integrity. So God gives you a shield. Your shield is integrity. He not only covers your backside, he'll cover your front side with his shield, even when you mess up, when you choose not to compromise your integrity. Number two, wisdom is peace-loving. We saw that in this verse, when it says the wisdom that comes from heaven is peace-loving. In other words, you're, you're looking for peace. Now, some people, they're troublemakers. They, you know, there might, it might be some of you. Maybe you, some of you like a good fight. Man, I love a good fight. Some people like to, they just, I don't know, it just gets them excited for some reason. They love to, they're always looking for a way to poke the bear, to stir the, the pot. Make, you know, bring gasoline when water would actually settle things down. But the Bible says that's foolish to do those things. That if you want to have good relationships and you don't want to be dumb, you are a peacemaker. And that's the second mark of wisdom in a relationship. If I want to be wise, I don't antagonize your anger. I don't provoke you. I don't egg you on. I don't push your hot button. Sharon talked, she opened up this, this series with talking about Button pushers. Some people love to push buttons. Now, if you're in a relationship for any length of time with somebody, you learn their buttons. I mean, you've pushed that button or one similar and you go, whoa, okay. And then you log it in your mind and it's either stay away, don't push that button or, uh, you know, they push my button, I know exactly where to go. How's that feel? See, you shouldn't do it. So that's antagonizing somebody. Somebody offends me, I want to offend them back. And sometimes we use, we'll, we'll pull it, put it aside. Somebody hurts us and we think, okay, I'm, you know, when I need this, I'll use it. And then we end up having uh, weapons of mass destruction that we use that we just, you know, we, in the moment, we may or may not be aware, but it's, it just devastates the person, radically alters the relationship, sometimes it ends it. You can never seem to get beyond it. You, and so a wise person is looking for resolution. The Bible says any fool can start an argument. The wise thing is to stay out of them. And so sometimes you're being baited. You know, you go on the internet and there's lots of places to, you know, vent there, you know, and social media or blogs. And people are, are constantly trolling and trying to bait you in to an argument. And you've got to be careful. If you're going to be wise, you're thinking, hey, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm not going to go down that road. And so you, maybe you have some, some tools, relational tools that you've used to get people back, to stir up arguments, and, and maybe it's time to retire those. Because the truth is, all of us know how to get people mad. So let's look at that. It's not like you need, we're like, this is review, right? We're, hey, I know how to get people mad. So in a quick review, how to get people mad, one is this, through comparing, right? And a good one is this, you are just like your mother. And you know, I don't like your mom. You're just like your dad. You're just like my ex. I mean, there's all kinds of comparisons that we do, and it makes people mad, in case you're wondering. You know, like that, it does not help. 
It's not resolving anything. In fact, it's foolish. It says anybody who compares is a fool. Anybody. So anybody can do it, but wise people don't. Condemning, laying on the guilt, making people, trying to shame them into uh, submission, shame them into something you think they should do. It usually actually creates the exact opposite result. For, for you women, you may not know this about men, but we're, also, we're always fighting with our own conscience. You know, we're doing things we're, we're, we don't like about it, that, that we wish we didn't do anymore, that we're still doing them, we're stuck. And we're fight, we have this internal fight going on. And so when you come in and you join the, the fray, the, all that anger gets, you know, you get the blowback of it. You get, you get in the middle of an argument you didn't even know you were part of. And so every time you go, you should do this, you must do that, you ought to do this, you never do this, and you're trying to use that condemning, you're just jumping right into the, the middle of that, and uh, it's foolish, and you'll end up uh, wondering what in the world hit me. And then contradicting. You know, now, this is particularly true in long-term relationships where somebody's telling a story, and they go, that's not how it went. You know, or they're just they're t- saying something. You're always being corrected. Do you have somebody like that in your life? They're always, they're always finishing your sentences. Well, you don't have to look at them, you know, just, but you know what I'm saying, right? You're thinking, yeah, always finishing my sentences. And so wisdom says, you don't do that. You don't do that. It says the wisdom is an art of knowing what to overlook. William James, the, the premier psychologist knowing what, what, I need to overlook that. I don't, I don't need to correct every single thing he or she does. A wise man controls his temper. He knows that anger causes mistakes. Has that ever happened to you? Where you got so angry, you said something, you did something, and you wish you didn't do it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've all fallen into that, right? I mean, that's really been popularized lately with Will Smith, right? How he got so angry. And at first, people, there's some people were saying, well, he was just protecting, you know, Jada. He's just, you know, he was just uh, uh, chivalrous. But listen, whenever we do something that where we, where we, you know, we're violent or we, you know, in this case, he, you know, he stood up, slapped him, started cursing at him, all that. that that's all about us. We can't blame, all, all of us screw up, you know, and, and our tendency is to start, you know, blaming somebody else. Or if you really like that person, we're trying to cover for them. But we have to own our own stuff. And you've heard me say before, I, I, first thing, I love Will Smith. I love his movies. And I think he's a great, you know, everything I know about him, he's a great guy. There, but by the grace of God, go I. I could have easily done that. In fact, I have done stuff like that. I just, I've just not, I'm not invited to the Oscars. So that hasn't happened. <laughs> but the places I go to, I do that stuff all the time. And then I think, why did I do that? You know, what was I thinking? But you get angry, you, you kind of lose perspective, and then you do things that you regret, and your next thing you know, you're in danger. You know, it's interesting, anger and danger are only one letter apart. And the minute you're in, you get all angry, next thing you know, you, it's danger zone. You're probably going to do something stupid unless you can... Uh, figure out what's going on. And, when, and anger, by the way, is a secondary emotion. So if you can take a moment and step back and say, okay, why am I angry? The, 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 and it almost always comes from two other emotions, fear or hurt, fear or both. And so you can have those in your life. And then now you're getting somewhere. Well, what am I really afraid of? Most, a lot of us don't want to admit that we're afraid. But that's often the root of it. Oh, I'm afraid she'll make me, or he'll make me, whoever, you know, will make me look bad. Or uh, I'm afraid I'll lose my job. I'm afraid I'll, you know, we'll end up getting divorced like it's happened to me twice before. Or what, I mean, we have all kinds of fears going on in our lives. Or we're just so wounded and, and in pain. But that's, what, that's what's going on. And we, we need to assess that and say, I don't want to just lash out because that will only make things worse. So you don't compromise your integrity, and you don't antagonize anger. Third, this is wisdom is gentle. Wisdom is gentle. It says wisdom that comes from heaven is gentle at all times. In the Living Bible, it says that the word gentle is translated courteous. In the NIV, it's translated considerate. All of those 
synonyms. Let everybody see that you are considerate in all that you do. When we're inconsiderate, when we're rude, that, shows, that just shows we're not operating in wisdom. And when people are inconsiderate and rude to you, if, a lot of times we just think, well, then they have it coming. But then we're just lowering ourselves to their standard. So the Bible says wisdom doesn't do that. Again, other people can't make you choose to do wrong. When we do wrong, it's on us. And it doesn't equal it out. If somebody does something bad to us, that doesn't like, okay, it's equal now. No, it's not how it works. It just means you're both fools. You know, we're both foolish because we're acting the same way. And the, but what helps me and, and what the Bible says is to do is, is to be considerate. In other words, look behind their words. And not just, in other words, somebody who is lashing out, somebody who's, who's trying to hurt you because hurt people hurt people right? Hurt people, they're hurting. So somebody who's lashing out verbally or physically, what they're saying is, I am in pain. And so they don't know how to handle that. They don't know how to verbalize it. They don't know how to resolve that. And so they're just going around hurting other people. What they need is kindness back. They, they get people that go around like that, that are lashing out, they get plenty of pushback all the time. But what we can do if we're going to bring wisdom into our relationships, is bring kindness instead. We must be considerate of the doubts and the fears of others. People that are in pain, people that are in fear, people that, are, that have anger problems because of that. We can be considerate. Let's uh, please the other person, not ourselves, in doing what's good for him and build him up. Doesn't mean that we're going to be a doormat. Let them do whatever they want to us. But it does mean that we're not going to just lower ourselves to their standard and immediately that's our go-to place. Because that's foolish in relationships. Particularly if you're in relationship with that person. And so we want to add wisdom into our relationship. So we don't invalidate people's feelings. Because feelings are not, usually are not rational, right? I mean, they're not that's what makes them feelings. That's, by definition, they're not rational. They're not necessarily logical. They don't necessarily make sense. And so when you're dealing with people's feelings, you, you just kind of recognize that's, you know, that's how they're feeling. Have you ever played the, the, the game, is it cold in here? You know, is it cold in here? Uh, you know, and somebody else says, yeah, I'm cold. Well, I'm not. Well, who's right? Well, you can't resolve that. Because it's based on a personal, that's how I feel right now. Or if somebody, you know, if you're, if you're in, a, in a relationship with somebody and you're, you know, guys, if your girl comes up to you and says, you know, I feel ugly. The, the, you know, that's a feeling. Now, probably what's not the best thing to say is, no, you're not ugly. What's wrong? I mean, it's, it's what's going on? I mean, there's, there's a feeling that's happening. Or I feel, you know, afraid. You know, I feel I'm, I'm scared. Well, there's nothing to be scared about. I mean, this is, it's not logical. It's not a logical thing. It's, it's validating people's feelings because if you, if we just try to invalidate it, that's a losing proposition. If I want to be wise, I won't minimize your feelings. And so people's feelings is part of who they are. And that's part of how we live in this world. And some people are just more, more aware of their feelings than others. But we all feel, we all have feelings. And so you don't compromise integrity. You don't antagonize anger. You don't minimize feelings. And certainly don't play psychologist, you know, because unless you are a psychologist, I guess. But sometimes we try to play psychologist. Oh, the only reason you're feeling that way is because of the way you were raised by your parents. You know, I mean, who made you a psychologist, you know, so, but we, we often fall, you know, just gravitate towards, you know, trying to solve plain psychologists. Kind words bring life, but cruel words crush your spirit. And so kind words, again, feelings, if somebody comes home and, and says, oh man, I had the worst day today. So what, what's probably not helpful to say, and this happens all the time, is this, you think you had a bad day, you should hear about my day. What, you're invalidating their feelings. I don't really care about what you feel because no matter what it is, it's not as important as my feelings. So that is not wisdom. That's not sympathizing, empathizing with them, being considerate. The 
verse we're looking at, wisdom is gentle at all times. Letting them be who they are and not trying to shut it down, but being aware. Hey, that, they, their, their feelings are important too. Wisdom is willing to yield to others. Our verse, the wisdom that comes from heaven is willing to yield to others. That, that phrase there, yield to others, the ESV translates it open to reason. The Living Bible translates it allows discussion. It really means not defensive, not, it means you're a good listener. You, you can listen well, instead of just listening uh, for your opportunity to talk or to say something or to respond. And so being foolish people, they don't want to listen. They, we talked about that, finishing people's sentences. One of the challenging things about listening to other people is, is when you disagree with them, right? Because when we disagree with people on certain things, Maybe their lifestyle or, you know, their political view. We tend to say, think, okay, you have nothing of value that I want to hear from. You know, I, and we dismiss everything. Instead of saying, no, actually, you probably have some things that I could, I could grow in. Can you, can you learn from people that you disagree with? That's a mark of wisdom if you can. Reminds me of the pastor, he's, he's new to the church and so he preached his first sermon, and then in his sermon, he said, hey, I'm open for suggestions, anything that you want to let me know at the end of the service. And so at the end, some guy comes up, and, and he goes, okay, what, what do you have? He goes, well, since you asked, he goes, that sermon stunk. Pastor goes, okay, well, he's trying to, you know, be considerate. He goes, well, let me, you know, can you be more specific? He goes, yeah, you read it, and you read it poorly, it sh and it should have never been read in the first place. And so another guy comes up and goes, oh, pastor, don't listen to old Jim. He just repeats what he hears other people say. So, <laughs> so well, sometimes when you open yourself up for suggestions, you'll get things and you have to pick out the meat, spit out the bones. Fourth mark of wisdom is if I want to be wise, I won't criticize your suggestions. When people are irritating you, when people, you think that they're wrong about their views and, and it doesn't mean that we can't learn. And so that's an issue of wisdom. If you want to have wisdom, you can learn. You can learn from anybody. Intelligent people are always open to new ideas. In fact, they look for them. There's, there's people that know stuff. Everybody here knows stuff you don't know. And you could benefit from if you are willing to listen. Sometimes there's also asking quality questions, but you're willing to listen and open up people that you disagree with. You know, and it, it's, as a Christ follower, part of what we do is point people to Jesus. It's not just like, well, I'm, I, I'm good with Jesus and I'm good with God. I don't need to talk about it anymore. No, our goal is, is to create a place in our, in our life where we have people in our lives that don't know the Lord. They're far from God. And so that we can, we can be an avenue of God's grace and point them to the Lord. But studies show that when somebody comes to Christ, the, every year they're, with, they're walking with God, every year that they're a Christian, they have less and less non-Christian friends, less and less people that are far from God in their lives. And that's, it, it takes a certain amount of intentionality, saying, no, I want that in my life. There's a part of us that sometimes we think, well, I don't want to hear what, you know, they're always telling bad, you know, they're cursing, they're telling jokes that I don't like, they're, they're behaving, they're getting drunk, they're doing this. And so we, sometimes it, it, it's a challenge because we have less and less in common. But when, when I, the people I have in my life intentionally that are far from the Lord, I find that they will listen to the, what I have to say if I first listen to them. If I'm willing to hear what, they, and sometimes, you know, their ideas are squirrely. You know, they're, I mean, they're just like off, you know, like what in the world? You know, they're just crazy ideas off the wall. But if I listen and hear them out, not just waiting, tapping my foot until they're done because they're weird. You're just weird. You don't know what you're talking about, you know, but listen and engage. Then they'll listen to what I have to say. And then it's my opportunity to step into that and share my faith with them. Because as Christ followers, God wants us, you know, God has no secret agents. Sometimes you know, I'm a secret agent. No, he has no secret agents. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're not, you know, if, if you're just doing good and nobody knows why, they might just think, well, oh, he must be a Boy Scout. She must be a Girl Scout, you know. No, we, we do what we do 
because of what Christ is doing in our lives. And we get opportunities to share that. Wisdom is full of mercy and good deeds. We see that in this verse. It says it's full of mercy and good deeds, wisdom that comes from heaven. So we maximize mercy. We look for opportunities to show uh, mercy to other people, to show grace when they mess up. The world is full of people that will judge us and come down and, 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 and have no compassion when we fumble or we mess up, we flub up. The wisest person is God. The, wise, the, the most merciful person is God. So when we're, wise, when we're wise and merciful and loving, we're most like God. And so we want to reflect that in our relationships because that brings life. The fifth mark of wisdom in a relationship is if I want to be wise, I won't emphasize your mistakes. Now, this is hard because our tendency is somebody makes a mistake. We, it makes us feel good to rub it in. You know, we want to we highlight it, and we don't want to forget it. And, uh, and then we might feel like we're being magnanimous and say, okay, we'll let it go. But really, we don't. We're holding on to it because we might need it later for leverage. You know, if I want them to, you know, do something that they don't want to do, or they make me feel bad because I screwed up. And I know, well, you know, most of us feel we, we don't screw up as much as others. But it happens. We'll, we, you know, we're, we're up front about that from time to time. And so I need some, some arsenal. You know, I need something that gives me leverage in that moment. And, and that's not loving. That's certainly not showing grace. And so if we're going to be different than the world operates, and we want the statistics, people are always quoting statistics. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, the statistics of, you know, of, of ruined relationships in the church is no different than the world. Well, if you act like the world, then that, true, that is true. But if, you're, if you do what... God says to do, that is not true. It can be different for you. Because uh, that's really a message that has no hope. And the Bible says that God is all about hope. So you can identify what voice it is that's trying to speak by saying, does that, is that loving? Is that hopeful? Does that, does that bring peace into my life? And, and, and the, you measure things. If you're not sure, well, it's just because there's a spiritual backdrop to most of life. And, and, and if you're not sure, well, is that God or is that, a, you know, like a fake spirit, you know? Well, look at the fruit. The fruit will, 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 will demonstrate where, where, where it's coming from. You go, Andy, are you one of those guys that sees a demon under every rock? No, but I do see a demon every, under every other rock, okay? Because they're out there. So if I want to be wise, I won't emphasize your mistakes. Love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. And so things that really bug you, people that are close to you, you learn to, uh, you know, as the great theologian Princess Elsa said, let it go, right? Let it go. And then number six, wisdom is impartial and sincere. Impartial and sincere. The verse, that's what wisdom is. No favoritism is always sincere. Uh, other translation, impartial and sincere. In other words, there, there's similar words that talk about being wholehearted, straightforward, this sincerity thing, not being two-faced, not being hypocritical. You know, the word hypocrite actually is a theatrical word. The Greeks created theater. And back in the day, they had limited actors, limited space uh, on the stage. And so they would have uh, in, in the course of a play, they would have one actor do multiple parts. They would go behind uh, the, the curtain, change their wardrobe, and have a different mask, and they would come out. And then when they wore a different mask, that's, that's a Greek word when they said they were a hypocrite. Now, of course, today, we use that word very derogatorily, and it should be. But what it means is somebody who wears a mask. They're not sincere. They're not... They're, 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 they're caught up in not being genuine, not being authentic. They're impartial. Here's the last point. If I want to be wise, I won't disguise my intentions. So you stop pretending. Now that's hard because when we, when we don't think we're going to be accepted, when somebody won't identify with our own struggle and and encourage us and pray for us, but we feel like we're going to get judged. All of us, we just clam up. Like, I can't share this. I can't be who I really am. 
I mean, there's some places where it's just like, it's, right, we're, we're not telling people what we really are. For example, a job interview, right? That's not the time to come clean, right? Oh, well, I gotta come clean with, well, no need to even go to that interview. When you're on a date or you're on one of these dating sites, very fake, because we're just showing the person, if you choose me, you lucky dog, look at what you get, woo! And we don't share all the, the, the other stuff. But the, I mean, in life, we have a challenge to will I take off my mask? Even though we've been hurt, even though we've been betrayed, even though we have a history, most of us have a relational graveyard filled with broken and hurting relationships that are buried, but they're back there. We know, we know how big our graveyard is. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to go back there, but it drives our decisions day in, day out of whether we will trust one more time, whether we will open up and take the mask off and be ourselves. Because the Bible says, fools are fake, but we want to be wise. The lips of a liar conceal hostility and whoever spreads accusations is a fool. So we don't want to disguise our intentions. We want to be honest with, with how, what we're going through. We don't compromise on integrity. We don't antagonize other people's anger. We don't minimize people's feelings. We don't criticize suggestions. We don't emphasize people's mistakes in their lives and we don't disguise our intentions. The Bible says respect for the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What's your next step? If you wanna become more wise, your next step, my next step is I wanna have respect for the Lord. God, I want to do it your way. Wisdom that is from above, heavenly wisdom. That's what it means to have respect for the Lord. I'm gonna do it your way, God. I'm gonna set aside my relational skills that I may be picked up from my home or whatever, because wisdom is not about intelligence. It's not about being brilliant. It's not about how smart you are. Wisdom is how we relate to people. And the source of wisdom is found in Christ. Jesus is the key that opens all the treasures, all the hidden treasure of God's wisdom and knowledge. It's only hidden until you turn the key and you say yes to Christ. You say, God, I want you in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for dying on my sins so I could be at one with God and that God's presence and his power can readily flow through me into my relationships, into my life. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. The Lord is here right now. He moves among us. Jesus, when he had a theologian asking him, how do you know? This guy asked Jesus, how do you know if God's near? How do you know if God's around? And Jesus said that it's like the wind, that you can see the effects. The, the, the leaves blow, the trees sway, the grass. You can see the effect. Even though you can't see the wind itself, you can see its effect. You can't see God's spirit, but his effect is on you. When he blows through a room like this, or those of you who are watching, when, he's, when you start to yield to him and say, God, I want you in my life, he starts to, you start to feel its effects. You start to feel some hardenings that maybe you've had for years against somebody, there's a little crack. It just starts to, it doesn't go away magically, but it starts to crack and opens up a little bit. And then a little glimmer of hope that maybe you can forgive, maybe you can let it go. Maybe you can have a different outcome than what you've had in the past or what your trajectory is today. And in that same discourse that Jesus had with that theologian, he invited him to have a fresh start. 
He said, the way you respond when you sense God's presence is you jump in both feet and you say yes to God. You say, God, I want, I want you in my life. Birth something new in me. That's your prayer. That's my prayer for you. I'm going to invite you to pray that right now. Would you say, dear God, right where you're at, you can just in your heart or in your mind, however you feel comfortable, say, God, today I want your wisdom in my life. Birth something new in me. Today I want to put my faith in Christ to unlock all of the hidden treasure that awaits me. You say, God, forgive me, empower me, and make me new. Help me to take my next step so that I can have a journey that's fulfilling with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed with me, let me know about it. There's a way for you to do that on the connect card that's in the seat back in front of you, or you can do the QR code. Another way to not only let me know about if you prayed with me, but any prayer requests you might have, anything else you might have, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we have step three right after the service uh, in our growth track. So uh, if you don't have to take steps one or two before that, uh, they're all independently uh, put together. So uh, it's our way of helping you journey with the Lord and help you to take your next step and fulfilling your purpose that God has for you. And so we'd love to have you. We'll watch your kids and feed you and all that. It's only an hour long. We'd love to have you come in right after the service uh, or just plan to do it next, next time you, you're available. Well, if you're new with us, don't feel pressured to give. We're just so glad that you're here. Uh, those of you who call us this church, your church home, we thank you for supporting Vineyard Church. Here's some ways that you can give as a reminder if you'd like to support uh, uh, our church and, and, and that's new for you, VCC. And then uh, actually just uh, text 45777, VCC and the amount or go online, however you'd like to do that. Let's close with a final song. Would you stand with me? And I wanna just transition in prayer, okay? Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you give to us that we can stand on that. It goes beyond the, 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 the constraints of time and human understanding. It's your wisdom so that we can have 